Um, we've been in a series called Not of This World, A Practical Guide for Uncommon Living. And today, we're going to look specifically at Hebrews 8, verses 1 through 13. And we're just going to see a treasure trove. Who likes treasure? Anybody? Anybody like, like, you know, you go in and you find some money you didn't know you had in your wallet? You dig around in an old sweatshirt and you find some treasure in there that you didn't know have. It's like, woohoo! It's super exciting, isn't it? Well, sometimes that's what the Word of God is like. You get in there, you're, you don't know what you're going to find, and all of a sudden you come out with like a million bucks in God's words and promises. But it's eternal, so it's even worth more than gold, more than rubies, isn't it? Amen. Well, Hebrews 8, we're going to look at today the better promise, the ministry and fulfillment that this new covenant brings with Jesus as our high priest. And we've been talking about this the last couple weeks going through Hebrews. Pastor Doug brought the word last week, and he reminded us that God doesn't keep score. Who's thankful for that? I know I am. But let's go ahead first. Let's open up in prayer today. God, we just come to you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you, God, that your mercies are new every morning. God, we thank you for your word, that it is life and truth and hope. God, we ask that you would just open up our eyes and our ears and our hearts today to receive your word. We welcome your spirit, God, and ask that you would just bless the reading of your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, if you want to follow along with me, we're going to look at Hebrews 8 and start in verse 1. Imagine that. Now, the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. So if you know and you've studied, you know that there was the Levitical priests that we've been talking about who had set up the tabernacle. But here in verse 1, it's talking about in heaven, the true and holy tabernacle that is actually an eternal tabernacle. It is the place that was actually a shadow of what the things that God gave to Moses were to come for the altar here on earth. And so we're seeing here that the true high priest is there in, in his majesty in heaven, and he serves in the sanctuary. How does he serve? By intercession on our behalf. He set up there, and he wasn't set up there by himself or by man, but he was appointed and set by the most high God. Verse 3, every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. Again, we've been learning that the high priest, they were set in the order of the Levitical priest, and they were appointed by God to represent him to the people. But they would have to go and they would have to bring their offerings and their sacrifices, and they would have to do this daily, and they would have to do it on behalf of the people but not just on behalf of the people. They'd also have to do it on behalf of themselves because they were not pure. They were not holy. They had to go through practices of cleansing and rituals to also make sacrifices for themselves. And so it says again in three, every high priest is appointed for gifts and sacrifices, and it, so it was necessary as one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest for there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law, the law given to Moses. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. So literally, what you're seeing in this verse that they, God gave to Moses is a copy and shadow of the tabernacle in the heavenlies. Actually, what's going on? And God gives it to Moses to bring to earth so that the people can commune with God. This is what Moses was warned. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. And this is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. So they had to follow inch by inch, color by color specifications that God wanted because he wanted it to be set up just like in heaven. And so they meticulously followed the guidelines, the blueprints that God gave. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received 
is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on a better promise. So today, that's what we're going to be talking about is the new covenant. Jesus came to fulfill the law, the, the old law that was given. He came to fulfill it. For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people, and he said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors, the Israelites, right? When I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and, they, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. What did the Israelites do? They followed idols. They broke down. They followed God for a season, for a moment, and then they got enchanted by idols. They got filled with their own sin and their own iniquities. And then they'd come back to him, and they'd make sacrifices and altars to God. And then they'd go away again, back and forth, because they were human. They were impure. But in verse 10, it says, this is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put the law in their minds, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will their neighbor, or no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least to the greatest. He's saying here, this is prophesying to the future, that no longer will they, you guys have to go out and tell your neighbors and evangelize about God because they will all know me. The word of God says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And we haven't seen that day yet, but it is coming. In verse 12, it says, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remove their sins, remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. So his final statement, he said, basically, there was covenants, they were good, they, they weren't perfect, but they did what they needed to do for that season, for those people groups. But what I'm bringing now is a new thing. It's superior. It's the highest and most holy of all covenants. What is a covenant? Well, a covenant refers to an agreement and a contract between multiple parties. Could be between two peoples. And in the Bible, obviously, God is involved in that covenant. It binds and establishes rights, responsibility, and obligations for all parties involved. Some of you are in covenant of marriage. You're, you're in a human relationship, and hopefully God is at the center of that. In the context of the Bible, it is sacred. It's God basically making agreements with his people and outlining the relationship for both parties. And it comes from a root word that literally means to cut. So this means in the culture of the Bible, the covenant that was carried out, it was often cut or sealed in blood. And so there's different stories in the Bible where God makes covenant and they literally divide the animal, they cut it, and they pass through it. And that was part of the covenant. There's other places in the, in the Bible where you see they sacrifice the lamb. They're literally using the blood for the sacrifice for the covenant there. Covenants in the Bible are significant because it reminds us of God's faithfulness, his commitment to his people, and his relationship, and his commitment to a relationship with us. The covenants serve as a foundation throughout history, outlining his promise, his expectation, his blessing, and the consequence of what happens when we obey God or when we walk away and we break that covenant. Ultimately, it highlights God's love, his grace for us and for humanity to reconcile us through his promises. Now, God gave a couple different covenants in the Bible. We're not going to go over all of them today, but just briefly, a little quick overview. Some of the covenants that you'll see is God gave an Edenic covenant. You find that in Genesis 2.16. An Adamic covenant, Genesis 3.15 with Adam. Noahic covenant, Genesis 9.16. The Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the land covenant, the David covenant, and the most 
high above all covenants, what we're talking about today, the new covenant. Now, the covenant with Noah, you guys, most of you should know the story, and if you don't, that's okay, but God literally said that he would never flood the earth again, and what was his sign of this covenant? He put a rainbow for the first time in the sky to, to make a sign and symbol for all to see, for us to see even today, to remind us of the covenant that God would never flood the earth again and just get rid of all the sin and unrighteousness in that way. He made a covenant with Abraham. He promised Abraham that he would give him descendants, and he would give them Canaan as an everlasting possession. He even said, I will make your children as many as the stars in the sky, who's been out late at night, maybe on Lake Powell, has seen those stars on Lake Powell when it's pitch dark and you get those amazing starry skies. Imagine the vastness of all those stars and the promise and the covenant God made with Abraham. God made a covenant with Moses on Mount Sinai where he gave him the Ten Commandments and the laws and the regulations for Israel to follow. He also gave him the blueprints for the tabernacle there. It established a special relationship between God and the people of Israel. Now, the next one we saw was the Davidic covenant. And if you didn't know, God even made a, a covenant with King David. And he basically said that David's descendants would rule over Israel forever and ever and ever. This covenant ensured the establishment basically of a Davidic dynasty where David would have a king in line for, eternal, for eternity, including our future king and Messiah who comes from the line of David. And we'll see this even in the future as Jesus comes and sits as king of the lion of tribe of Judah in David's dynasty as he sits in Israel as king in the future. Now, obviously, we know now he is king and he's sitting in heaven as king. The new covenant today where we're looking at Hebrews is a covenant of grace and forgiveness through Jesus. Sacrifice on the cross, and again, it replaces every covenant before. They were all good. They were all meant for that time and season, but they were not perfect. There was, they were not perfected until Jesus stepped in a pure and holy and worthy lamb. Each covenant has its own significance, but God's gives us all access to his throne, to his presence, to his kingdom. And today I just say thank you for that, Lord. Hebrews 8, verse 5, reminds us that the covenant, including the high priest stewardship, served as a copy and a shadow. So we just read that, that it was literally a shadow, and that the priest held positions of great honor and responsibility. And they would, at times, they would go into the Holy of Holies, into the inmost chamber of the tabernacle, where the presence of God felt and was dwelt. However, in Hebrews 8, 1 through 2, it unveils a truth that surpasses earthly priesthood, that we have a high priest in Jesus who is currently right now at this moment seated at the right hand of God, ministering in that sanctuary. He is superior. He is living. He is active. And he is king. God gave these blueprints to Moses on Mount Sinai to be stewarded by the high priest. Have you guys ever stewarded anything? Maybe a garden. Maybe your kids getting them to the school every, week, every day. There's different things we can steward, but these Levitical priests were given the tabernacle to steward and to follow rituals. And this literally follows in line to foreshadow what Jesus was to come and to do. We don't have time to get in it all specifically today, but every single step in the purification, in the cleansing, in the way the tabernacle was set up and drawn and set up was a basic representation of who Jesus was, what he would do in his life, and how he would redeem us. Amazing. It's amazing. Within the tabernacle, there were sacred items and structures. They would have to diligently handle these holy objects out of reverence and fear, because if they didn't, they would die. 
that there was the presence of God in this place. And so they, at times, they would get to go in and they would get to, only the ones that were elected, let me just say this, they were chosen by God. Those that would carry the presence were chosen. It just wasn't for anybody to go up and, and say, today I think I'll carry the Ark of the Covenant. But even within among the priests, only certain ones could do it. They had to be chosen. And they would carry the Ark of the Covenant on poles on their back. They couldn't touch it. What do you do when you touch something? You put it in your hands. What do you think? This is mine. You own it. And God is saying here, you don't get to own my presence. You get to steward my presence. And he allowed those assigned priests to put the poles on their back to fill the kabod, the glory of God, to fill the weight in holy reverence. But they didn't get to touch it. Now, there's seasons in, in this biblical story where you see that the enemy camp comes in and they take the ark and actually God allows them to because... Could they have just done it if God didn't want them to? No, they could have died. But God allowed them to take the ark. And when they took it, they put it on carts with wills. And they willed it out. And then when they got sick of it because it was causing problems for them, they put it on a cart and willed it back. So later on, well, actually David went to go get it and he willed it back. So when David went to get the cart, he decided, well, we'll just go get it and will it back. But he didn't follow the design and the purpose of what God had set up. And so when he sent people to get it and put it on a cart, they did it the world's way. And sometimes as a church, as a body, I hope that's not what we're doing, is that we're doing things the world's way because it got it done, they did it, Why? that's the way we should do. No, but that we would look back on God's words, his directions, and that we would follow what he's asked us to do because he has a divine plan and reasons for doing things. And when they did that, one of the guys had it on the cart, he went to put his hand up, he accidentally touched it and he died. And then David thought, well, I thought we were going to have this big celebration because we're bringing the ark back. And God basically told him, you know, you need to go back and look at my directions and my plans. And so they went back and they did it the right way. They carried it this time in honor and reverence on poles, and they didn't touch it. They didn't own it. They stewarded it. Yeah, it's so good. Preparation. Before entering the Holy of Holies, these priests would have to meticulously prepare themselves. We're talking ritual after ritual after ritual um, for themselves, for the people. A couple weeks ago, I showed you some pictures of some ritual baths that are even now being unearthed in Israel, where they would go down one side and then they would go out the other because they wouldn't want to bump into somebody and have to turn around and go back out because then they'd have to get back in. They couldn't even bump into somebody else, so they would go in and out and have people lined up behind them to do the same. So just tons of things they would do to clean their garments, to wear the right clothes, to make sure that they were ceremonial clean. Now, at one time a year, they would go in and they would have the Day of Atonement. And obviously, every day they would have sacrifices and do this daily. But once a year on the Day of Atonement, the priest would take a censer and he would fill it with burning coals from the altar and two handfuls of finely ground incense. And the incense was specifically prepared according to, of course, God's instructions, right? They would scatter the incense on the burning coals and they would cause it to make a cloud and smoke and, and make it rise. Now, this represented intercession. And as a courageous church, one of the things we are passionate about here is prayer and intercession. So I think this is so vital for us to know as a church that, that even as the priests went in, they would take the incense and they would bring it into the Holy Holies. And they actually would even have a rope tied to them because if they weren't clean or they did something wrong, they would literally be killed and fall dead, and they would have to grab the rope and drag them out. So you better know that day that priest did everything as a high priest he could to make sure he was right before God. But before he would completely go in to the Holy of Holies, the high priest would take that incense and flood the entire tabernacle with the incense so that the smoke would basically make a veil 
basically covering him, and it would basically give him somewhat of a protection from the Most High God. It would basically give him a little bit of a veil so that he wouldn't have to look at the presence and the glory of the Lord because it was so powerful, so mighty, so strong. And this smoke created a veil, and it even covered the mercy seat, which is the lid of the ark. As he would come, he would ask for mercy and grace from the people. In the picture here, you can see a temple, the newer temple that was built. And this gives you an example of the inner courts of the temple, the outer courts. And then as you go in, only the certain high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. Now, obviously, in uh, Moses' time, they were tents. They were set up in the desert, but later on, they graduated to building the temple. The most holy place housed the Ark of the Covenant, which actually represented the throne of God. His mercy and his presence, his superiority, his mightiness, can you even imagine it dwelt here? The tabernacle had designated people that would come and do this, and it was just pure and holy. Within this place. There was uh, burnt offerings, golden lampstands, the table of showbread. Each per pl place had a purpose and a symbolism, and I'm sure we'll get more into those in the coming weeks. These items, though, were temporary. They were made of earthly materials, where we know that we have God, our high priest, and what he's done is spiritual, and what he's done for his body and his church is eternal and, and just we get to partake in it, guys. It's so amazing. I can't even wrap my mind around it, but I'm so thankful. Hebrews expands on the symbolism of the tabernacle, describing this God, Jesus, our God, as the ultimate high priest who entered into the true heavenly sanctuary, offering himself as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Now, did anyone in high school or junior high, maybe, maybe yesterday, I don't know, you have a, a friend or some friends and you're out and you want to go swimming and you just happen to have, you know, a community pool nearby or maybe your friends or neighbors have a pool. Maybe there's even a hotel that you're close to and you really like their pool, but you know, it's not yours and you think, hey, what the heck, I'll just jump over the fence and go swimming. Anybody? Well, in this kingdom, in John 10, 1, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. Just an example of something fun that we, we do. But in the kingdom of heaven, we don't get to just jump the fence. We don't just get to go around the corner and do our way or sneak in just at the last minute. It says, it says, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, we all have to enter through the same way. This week as I was preparing, I was just reading about shepherds and the shepherds in the wilderness, they would go and they would set up um, stones in a circle and they would make them high to protect the sheep. And the sheep knew the shepherd's voice and the shepherd could call them and they would come running to him. They wouldn't listen to other people's voice, but they knew the shepherd's voice. And he would call them when it was night and he would rally them in to come inside this uh, little pen made by rocks in the wilderness, no gate, no latch, and he would get him inside, and then he would lay his body at the gate, and he would be basically the gate, and he would protect them from wolves, from bears, from predators, from thieves and robbers, and he would be there to make sure that they didn't get hurt or escape. John 10, 9, it literally says that Jesus, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture. And that's exactly what Jesus did for us, is that he called us by our name. He, the good shepherd, called us to come and follow him and come through him as the door. John 10, 14, 6 says, you want to put that up? Jesus said to him, John 10, 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
There's no other way. Not one. You can't jump the fence. You can't go around. You can't get your friend to get you a cool tag or pass. Jesus is the door. And I'll say this too. Jesus never just sneaks into a city. He doesn't just kind of come in sneakily and not let anybody know he's there. He doesn't sneak into your heart. He doesn't sneak into your life. But he comes as we thank him, as we praise him, as we worship him, and we acknowledge him as the good shepherd. We follow his voice, and we declare that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? Amen. Now, Hebrews um, 8, 6, it reveals that this covenant was established on the better promise. Wouldn't you say Jesus is pure and holy sacrifice is better than all the ones before him? Yes. In Hebrews 8.10, it's showing a fulfillment of promise in Jeremiah. It says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I'll put the laws on their minds and write them on their hearts, and I'll be their God, and they'll be my people. So before, they put their laws where? On stone tablets. Okay, he's saying, No, I don't want that anymore. I want each one of you to take ownership of it. And where is this coming from? It's actually coming from Jeremiah, which was spoken in the Old Testament from a prophecy from the prophets in Jeremiah 31. If you want to put Jeremiah 31 up next, it says in verse 31, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. You see that? The days are coming. And now in Hebrews, we're seeing where, there, where it's come. But he declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant in the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers when a day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant that will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws within them. I'll write it on their hearts. I'll be their God. And guess what? They will be my people. Yeah. Jesus brings transformative stewardship of our hearts and and souls. Okay? The The old covenants were outdated. They weren't working. So he came to what? To fulfill them. He came to fulfill the law. Jesus is the ultimate steward. The high priest, they stewarded the best they can. They did the best they, they could to steward the presence. But God is the presence. And he is the ultimate high priest. He intercedes on our behalf. Just like I told you when the priest once a year would go on the Day of the Atonement into the Holy of Holies, and he would have that protection of incense of vel shielding him, and the incense would fill the Holy Holies, and the smoke would create an atmosphere of reverence, of awe. It heightened the sense of the divine presence and separated this space from the outside world. Can you imagine being in that room with the presence of God? Well, that's, too, what Jesus did. On the cross, he's on the cross, and he's there to sacrifice in death for us as an act of intercession. The very last minute, what does Jesus do? Luke 23, 34, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As he's literally entered into the presence of God, he's saying, Father, forgive them, for they know what they, not what they do. And then he spilt his blood, just like the high priest did, on the mercy seat. And then he went to be with the Father in heaven where he's seated now, making intercession on your behalf. Church, that is so powerful that we have a God that intercedes on our behalf. Amen. And he did it once and for all. He's seated. It's done. He doesn't have to do it again. We have forgiveness. We have mercy. We have access to God by this act. Amen. Amen. Now, inside of the tabernacle, there was an Ark of the Covenant. And in this Ark, there was three main items. First, there was the stone tablets of the law that represented God's righteous standards, his mandate, the law that was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, and it reveals God's holiness and all of his guidelines for his people. 
okay? Second in the ark was the jar of manna. And we see the manna was provision that God provided. It was literally a miracle. The manna represents a miracle. Every day, miraculous faith that God will provide your next meal. Anybody had to live that? That every day, but they couldn't store it. They couldn't hoard the manna because if they did, it would go stale. And that's the same thing as the word of God. You can't store it up. You can't just read the word of God for a season and then think you're going to get by on that. God wants us to eat the bread of life. He is the bread of life. He wants us to be in the word daily so that it doesn't go stale in our lives and our hearts because he's written his words. He's written his laws on our hearts. The third item was Aaron's rod, and it symbolized God's authority and leadership. Earlier in the Old Testament, God appointed Aaron. And how did they know that Aaron was supposed to be the high priest? Well, he had a rod and other people had rods, but Aaron's rod was the only one that budded. It literally grew flowers on it. And it showed God's authority and his leadership appointed by God, not by a priest or by man. Jesus is our high priest. He was appointed by God, and he exercises divine authority that leads us into righteousness and into truth. Amen. Jesus is the fulfillment of this ark. Anybody want to feel the presence of God in their lives? Anybody want to see and know, taste and see that Jesus is good? I know I do. And I want to do it daily so that I don't grow still, so that I know that God's laws are written on my heart, that I have a relationship, that I'm walking with him daily. Lastly, today, we get to see that Jesus is the ultimate high priest. He is considered the perfect sacrifice, the perfect lamb, the pure, holy, blameless one. He fulfills the Ark of the Covenant because he embodies God's presence. He serves as the ultimate mediator, like the priest of old, but now he comes as our lamb, the holy one to reveal God's word. He demonstrates divine protection and power, and he establishes not a covenant for a minute or for a season or for a certain group of people, but for eternity, for you, for me, and for everyone in this world. And if you're watching today from another place, I want to say that's from you. Jesus is the king. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Lamb of God, and he is the ultimate high priest. Amen. If that touches you today and you haven't received Jesus yet as Lord and Savior, you haven't received his words written on your heart, you're not daily with him. You want to have a relationship. You want to know him. You want to receive what he did as he sacrificed for you, as he interceded for you. Then I just want to invite you today to say a quick and simple prayer with me. Jesus, Lord, Savior, God, I just come to you, and I thank you, Lord, that you have atoned for all of my sin, that you paid the ultimate price, that you bought my life when you died on that cross for me, that you interceded to the Father on my behalf. And Lord, I receive you as my Lord, as my Savior. I want to walk with you. I want a relationship with you. I don't want to practice religion, but I want to know you as Lord come into my life today. Make me whole. Make me cleansed and righteous as you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.